and mathematics, and then went on to study at Harvard, Oxford, and Columbia University. But he says in his own bio narrative that he always wanted to be a sixth grade teacher, that teaching was really what he always aspired to. And uh, we know, of course, from his career, which has been spent teaching at all levels, elementary, secondary, uh, middle school, uh, at the university level, where he is currently teaching and working in the public schools, uh, working in a teacher prep program, and in the public schools. What we know is that he has never wavered from that desire to teach. That has been his life's work. And uh, we've talked about his writings in class, and you're familiar with some of these books, so without further ado, let me present to you Herbert Cole. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you might want to talk about. So I'm gonna ramble on for a few minutes, but what I'm gonna do is give you an opportunity and an occasion to frame some questions. And then I think we can really have a conversation. And it's the, the, the opportunity to frame those questions with which you would almost like your own students when you teach in, a, in school to be able a lot. You have a structure in which they are processed. And of course, you can't develop your mind unless you can speak intelligently and thoughtfully about things that are of interest to you. It's terribly important to steal time if you have to when you become a teacher in order to have enormously important, and believe it or not, it will have profound effects on the capacity of your students to develop all kinds of skills. It's terribly important. Um, my students, um, I teach at the University of, I run a program at the University of San Francisco called the Center for Teaching Excellence and Social Justice. So, um, what we're focused on is not only teaching excellence, but issues of social justice, issues of racism, issues of sexism, issues of homophobia, issues of um, equity, and how they play out in the schools and in the classroom. Um, and, and, and we try to work all of those things in with how you read, write, do math, do science, but this is basically a social justice oriented program. And I would have to say, if, if you've read my books, in all of my books, the covert, and in many cases, the overt agenda is that um, teaching without a concern for human rights and social justice is um, not worth doing. And um, it's, it's just um, uh, a deeply part of let me say what I learned from my grandparents who are immigrants to the United States and um, what I learned from my engagement in the civil rights movement and in the anti-war movement and in the environmental movement. And, you know, I'm one of them people who is out there. Um, I'm very blessed in the sense that my wife's out there too, <coughs> as are my three children. So um, there's no big conflict. To me, it seems a very simple matter that everybody should have access to the resources that anybody else has, that everybody should have a right to let, its, let, let her or his intelligence flower. You know, I mean, I think there's really a question then of how as a teacher do you allow your students' intelligence 
flower as opposed to getting them to become obedient. Because you can be disciplined and intelligent, but you can't be just obedient and be intelligent without being enraged and exploding somewhere else. So teaching is an incredibly creative, very, very difficult challenge. That's one thing. It's kind of magical. You know, when I, um, it's real interesting, when I come from the airport, when I go to New York, and I um, come from the airport, I get, I have a police escort um, all the time. Uh, and what I mean by that is that when I started teaching in 1962, I had a student who was um, rather wild. Uh, I'm just understating it. <laughs> um, who was really quite wonderful, but kind of going in 20 different directions, you know, and felt that since nothing was connecting with him in class, he would have everybody have to connect to him because of his slightly outrageous behavior. And I got to know his parents very well, and uh, Bill Fredo and I became good friends. And I managed to teach him to read through literature that really made sense to him, you know, through books that really made sense to him. And it was my job, by the way, to find those books, which I did. I mean, you know, you have to be a restless researcher in the service of your students. In other words, don't ever try to repeat something that someone has failed. Find something new. Find a new way to do something if the old things don't work. But if they don't work, what's the point? You end up creating resentment, you don't create learning. And he and I, but anyway, he, he, his choice was to belong to one of, of two types of gangs. The first gang was on the streets, and the second gang was on the streets. One happened to be against the law, and one was the law. So he became a New York City cop, and ended up a police sergeant and a detective and a lieutenant, and then retired uh, at an age much younger than I'm going to be able to retire, with a with a nice pension and all. And um, and he and he's right now one of the more gentle people you'll ever meet. He really kind of passed through the whole terribly difficult thing of learning what law enforcement is all about. You know? And so whenever I get to New York, he comes with his car and he puts up his patrolman's benevolent association sticker on the car and honks out in front, you know, and uh, takes me wherever I want to go. Uh, it's really interesting. These things come around. They really come around. Right now, uh, for example, you know, if, if you stay in long enough and you care enough, you will stay in contact with your students. Not all of them, because you can't. I mean, how many children can you have? <coughs> right? But, you know, they will grab a hold of you at important times in their lives. Usually it's a death marriage, you know, some uh, chance encounter. Uh, I, uh, right now, am doing a, um, I have a class that I teach called Perspectives in Education. And I'm lucky as a, as a professor and as a, since I run the program, that I can do anything I want to do with it that's within the bounds of responsibility education. You know, so I can I can walk on the margins. It's a very interesting position to be in. You know, it's a lot of fun, by the way. So you can so for this class I decided I wanted to do something that I've been dreaming about doing for years. Um, about twenty years ago, must be more than twenty years ago, a group of people in Australia sent me a little can you know, a little tin can, like a little cigar box, a little cigar can. And in the can, they had a roll of Super 8 film. A, um, if, I don't know if any of you remember, this is before VCR.
arms for people who would do movies with Super 8. Uh, a little roll of Super 8 film and a, um, a thir <coughs> roll of 35 millimeter film and a um, oral tape, you know, a cassette tape, a 60 minute tape. And they said, we're sending this to all the educators who publish books in the entire world and we want to create a museum and a documentation of what they think about children. Absolutely fascinating. I kept it. I didn't do it, by the way. <laughs> I feel, to this day, I feel guilty about it. I never returned it. I still have the roll of film, the Super 8 roll. I have the whole thing. Um, but I never, I, 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 my life was too busy those days. Um, this was Berkeley in 1968-69. And I guarantee you, um, we were all very busy. <coughs> And so, uh, so what happened was I decided what I would do for my students this year as one class that they have is give each of them a videotape, a computer disc, a roll of 35 millimeter film, and a um, cassette tape. And tell them, okay, what I'd like you to do is document the lives of children that you and you could do it in school, right? You could do it on the streets. You can do it with your own relatives. You can mix and match, you know, but look carefully at children in the world as you see them. So that you can begin to shape some feeling of your own on how young people are. And by documenting them, you make, and you can use two roles of film. You can't use two videotapes, and you can't use two oral tapes, but you can go interview them, and I provided them with the cameras and the tape recorders and whatever equipment they needed in order to do it. And um, then I said, oh my God, I have 25 hours of videotape, 36 times 25, photographs, right? Um, 26 hours of um, oral history and um, diaries and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of the teachers just put kids' writings and everything on the computer disk. How in the world am I gonna handle this? This is, by the way, one of the most interesting things that you'll all face. I'll make a digression and I'll come back to why I was saying the story. Um, when you really get kids to become creative, you will find that they will produce more than you could read in grade. In, in particular, in literature. If they wrote, if you get 30 kids in a class, and they write five times a week, and you've got five times 30, 150 papers to do something with during the week, often the temptation is to give the kids less to do in order to give yourself a little breathing space to have a life. But remember, this is time after you teach. This isn't while you're in the classroom, this is after you teach, you still have to grade these things, or you have to respond to these things, you have to in some way be in connection with them. And so, one way I found to do this, by the way, is um, get the kids to write as much as possible, and then, and read it all. But, get them on Thursday to choose one of the four things they've done to revise that you will really consider seriously. You know, that you will then seriously analyze and get the grammar correct and, and, and talk about the ideas and talk about possibilities and how to do it. Because in a sense, you have to pace your life as a lot of people don't let pe young, young people going into teaching know that. See, you can produce, I mean, you, the kids are, have more energy than you'll ever have. And if you multiply their energy times the number of kids there are, look at what you have. Uh, th there's this beautiful stew there. Well, my friend Ishmael Reed calls it a gumbo. The reason it's a gumbo as opposed to a stew is the stew all the flavors get mixed together. The, 
gumbo is all the flavors stay apart. So when you pull stuff out of the gumbo, you have a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. And really that's what you want. You don't want to mix it all together. You want the uniqueness of everybody to persist. So I said, what am I, what in the world am I gonna do about all of this material that, that's been produced for my, these are my teacher ed students. And these are all people who in California, there are a lot of people who teach on emergency credentials, which means they don't have teaching degrees, but they have BAs. And they pass this test called the um, CBEST, it's just, it's the equivalent of a high school equivalency exam. And then they can get a job teaching full time. And they're given two to three years to finish their credential program. You know, you, you have to in, enroll in a credential program. And you don't have to have a master's, but you, you have to get a credential after a certain amount of time. So all of my students are in the classroom all the time. And then they go to school at night. And then they have to do all this other stuff that I'm asking them to And then, to live in San Francisco on $35,000 a year or is um, not the easiest thing in the world unless you have three roommates and a lucky apartment, <laughs> you know? Or rich parents, in which case that really does help. But, um, uh, and so, I said, how in the world am I gonna do this? And I called an old student of mine who uh, is, been a friend for years. His name is Frederick Douglass Perry. And Fred was part of a, a high school I ran in Berkeley, which was quite wild. It was during People's Park, the um, Jackson State murders, the um, Kent State murders, the uh, anti-war movement. Uh, it, it, it was, have any of you seen a movie called Billy Jack? You seen Billy Jack? Fred's the African-American guy in Billy Jack, former student of mine. And all the kids in Billy Jack were students of mine in my high school. Yeah, it's, I mean, if you want to see what some of that sentiment of those days were, of course, this took place in New Mexico, <coughs> the, the film did, but those kids were, were, were flown out from Berkeley. And um, so Fred never got a high school. Never got a JC degree, never went to college. What he did was he went straight to KQED television, which is the national public television station in San Francisco. Became a cameraman, then became head of the union there, then became a producer of national television programs and programming, and knows more about media than I will ever know in my life. And so tomorrow, when I'm in the plane on the way back to San Francisco, he's taking over the class and is gonna help the students organize all this media stuff. And he's gonna help me. Because he knows more than I do. See, the, the beauty of, of, of teaching is that you will end up, if you're successful and effective, and if the world is right, and if your students manage to survive the complex paths that they have to go through, they will know more than you know. So you're always going to have to work to keep up with them. You know, you, so, so what that means is as a teacher, you're always going to have to be a learner. That you, you can't just teach. You have to learn and teach at the same time. And when, if you ever find yourself saying, I don't have to learn anything more about what I'm doing, you, you turn teaching into a mechanical task. Into a job rather than a vocation or a profession. And you might want to think about something else at that point, if you can afford to. But it's really, really important to understand that teaching requires the constant creative and, 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 and struggling and um, inquiring mind of the teacher, as well as the kids. And that's why teaching is so exciting. I mean, the reason I went into elementary school teaching is I can teach anything. Teach science, even if I don't know science. I can teach math, no matter how much math I do. I can teach literature, I can teach poetry and theater. 
as I, I love to teach theater. And I, how did I learn to teach theater? By teaching it and reading a bunch of books and then learning from my students who um, basically were much better in theater than I was. When I was running this high school in Berkeley that Fred went to, there's another guy by the name of Phil who was there. Um, and um, we were doing an improvisation and it all had to do with um, anger and rage and all. And he really scared me to death. He's bigger than I am. His, his father was a county sheriff in Alameda County and he was tall and um, you know athletic and quite brilliant but he started screaming and doing all of this stuff and I really started sweating I really you know I started you know, and then he just cracked up and laughed and said see her if I got you I got you he did he got me very interesting that, 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 that but he didn't want to get me. He just wanted to show that he had some power too. You know, that he had some real power, which a lot of kids do. And if you, if you don't laugh at those things, and if you don't have a sense of humor about those things, uh, uh, you, you're gonna end up having a very hard time. What he eventually did, and, 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 and I'm, I'm mentioning Fred and, and Phil, by the way, one's African American, one's um, as, as, as a white Protestant guy. Phil was a white Protestant guy. In New, you know, I'm a New Yorker, so in New York, everybody's defined according to who you are, where you come from, what's your background, please. Not negatively, you just everybody just does that as a matter of course. It's a it's a New York habit. Actually, I'm not from New York. I'm from the Bronx, which is is a small nation north of Manhattan. <laughs> What he eventually did was um, decided that he wanted to be a clown and an acrobat. And he went to the Ringling Brothers um, Clown College, you know, in Sarasota, Florida, and he graduated from there. And um, one of the last times I saw him, he was working, he was cleaning up after the lions <laughs> in the Oakland Coliseum and during the performance of the circus. And then he became the rigging chief for um, Philip Glass and Philip Wilson, you know, for Einstein on the beach and all. And he became really a, a, a great set designer and rigging person. The reason I mention that is that schools these days try to obsess teachers with the idea that there are only one or two things that kids can do. Oh yeah, you're gonna go into high tech. High tech meaning if you're certain people, you're gonna do $7 an hour of data entry and if you're other people, you're going to control the companies. And it depends on the background and the family and, I mean, and all kinds of other attitudes that are culturally ingrained. Or if you're not high tech, you might become a teacher or something else. <coughs> or an entrepreneur. There are thousands of things to do in the world. And there are thousands of things that people do in the world that we never uh, I wonder if you're aware of the fact that the entertainment industry in the United States has more people working in it than the automobile industry, the steel industry, the coal industry, or any manufacturing industry. And to go into entertainment doesn't mean to be a superstar. It doesn't mean to be a rock star. There are entertainment lawyers, there are bookkeepers and accountants, there are people who do sound mixing and run studios. There are people who work on all the sets of movies doing lots and lots of very interesting unionized jobs. So one of the other things is you begin to kind of get your kids to express to you their aspirations and their dreams is to see how their dreams can be followed appropriately in a way that also allows them to make a living. And there are many ways to do this, not just one. So I think, I think, you know, for example, I wouldn't have said the same thing about the entertainment industry 
when I started teaching in 1962 as I would say now, because it wasn't in the same place. I mean, that's our largest export. You know, music, CDs, movies, and all that stuff. I think also that I, I would personally have begun to really think about teaching all kids how to run a small business. So that they all can have some very active sense of them being able to create their own space and their own place and their own way of doing things. It's really important. I think it's also important, and, and, and this is the last thing I'll say, I don't know how long you, you all intended to be here, but um, is that if we do not deal with resolving <coughs> questions of diversity in this society, we are going to explode as a nation. That there is no question in my mind that one has to deal with issues of race, language, and all in ways that become inclusive, <coughs> in ways that enlarge our perception that everyone can enrich us. And in fact, I don't even like to use the word us. Because when you say everyone can enrich us, you assume the us is the white culture. Right? And so everyone can enrich each other is a much more appropriate way of looking at what we have to do. And I think this has to be done consciously and clearly. And it can be done everywhere and anywhere, but it has to be. I'm ready, I'm you've had enough time now to formulate some questions, so I'm ready for some questions, okay? Anybody have any questions? Sure, nobody has any questions. Oh, actually, I have two. One is a, a non-traditional student in my Today, um, the answer is yes. Um, every once in a while, um, my hair gets wild and crazy, and I love it that way. But while he was still alive, my father got always got angry at that and kept on screaming at me to get a haircut. And as he got much older, I was willing to make a concession to him. I mean, when he was no longer powerful. You, you know, I mean, it, 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 I, there was no longer a battle, you know, when he, from the time he was 85 till he died in 90. And for five years, I mean, he just died recently. So my hair is not as long as it's going to be in a month. <laughs> I guarantee you. <laughs> but I have a more serious question. Too. Okay. I, um, last night I, I read your Creative Maladjustment essay. Mm -hmm. And as I said, uh, the students for the last few years in my class have been growing minds on becoming a teacher. And one of the things they, they struggle with is how do you um, be that revolutionary in the classroom? How to go against the grain, especially in a state like Maryland that is so assessment driven, high stakes assessment driven, not just for the kids, but for the teachers as well. And, and how do you find those cracks in the sidewalk that, that, or whatever it is that allows people the space to do those creative, maladjusted kinds of activities that are essential? That's a very good question. Um, for which I don't have a set answer, but and we have the same problem in California, and the people I work with in Texas have the same problem. First thing you have to do is analyze how you actually use your time. You know, um, how much time is really needed to do what is demanded of you, because frequently is much less time than you think, you know? In other words, what, what, what you become is a time theft as a teacher. Because what you're really doing is stealing time to be yourself and let the kids be themselves. And that is, a, 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 see, the reason I can't give you one set answer is it changes from school to school. For example, if you're just in your room and the door's closed and nobody cares and nobody's going to bother you, 
and you develop the confidence to teach, and you study the test and know that you're going to work what's in the test into what you really want to teach, then you have a lot of freedom. If someone is watching you all the time, is sitting on your shoulder, is making demands of you that are outrageous, the answer is find another job. You know, don't be afraid, and, and, and also don't be afraid to be fired. Frequently, the, the, the teachers that I've seen that have survived are the ones with guts and confidence. No, I'm doing something because I really believe in it, and this is what I'm doing. But be clear about what you're doing. In other words, don't just get angry and all, but be clear. I'm, for example, having these conversations and debates in my classroom, which are not part of the standardized curriculum, in order to develop the linguistic skills to allow my kids to do well on the comprehension parts of the standardized tests. So I made an argument. And so what I want you to do is argue with me about my argument. Is it or is it not true that if you speak well, you tend to understand reading better? I'll give you an example. I am having my students play chess in the classroom because I want them to develop higher level cognitive skills. Hey, put that one out to your friends. <laughs> and these higher level cognitive skills are enormously important in terms of the mastery of some of the things that are demanded of them, but also, of course, they're wonderful because it's good to think. I mean, that's something that I guess you probably couldn't get away with in some places. Um, we're doing theater because the capacity for integrated expression, I'm just making these up. <laughs> <laughs> no, you gotta learn to improvise. The capacity for creative expression is necessary in order to create a coherent student environment in which learning will be facilitated. That was pretty good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but these are things that sometimes you have to do. You have to really begin to think through. See, the crucial thing as a teacher is you have to have self-critical practice. That you have to be thinking a great deal about your work as you're doing it. Is this working? Is this not working? How are my students understanding this? Are they uh, understanding or not understanding? What's the level in which um, some kids are learning and other kids are not learning. And you will never, ever solve all those problems. With my class of 20, two, 23 people now, this is my um, teacher ed class. I am still, and we started in August, struggling to figure out what they're learning. I'm not only struggling to figure out what I can teach, but struggling to figure out what they're learning. And are they learning the kind of things that are useful <coughs> to them? And I've had occasionally to just take a text that I wanted. I, we were reading a text by Vygotsky. And I'm walking, and everybody had to read it, and they were going to do some critical judgments on it. And I looked at the class, and you can see these faces were blank. <laughs> In fact, what I had done was chosen a text that they did not have the background to truly master. It wasn't their fault. It was a misjudgment on my part in terms of what I thought they had already known. You know, because, you know, they were all practicing teachers. And hey, I said at the beginning of the year, have you heard about Vygotsky? And everybody goes, yeah. Because nobody wants to say, no, I haven't. Because they assume that if they say, no, they haven't, I'm going to think they're done. This is before we got to know each other. That doesn't happen anymore. Of course, it's that creation of trust and honesty that you have to create. So I said, so this was very hard, huh? But I was ready to move on to another text the next time and all. And instead, we just did a simple textual reading of 12 pages for one two-hour class, two-and-a-half-hour class, reading 12 pages 
with me filling in a little history and a little background and a little understanding of why this is important. Because what they didn't understand is, first of all, what they were reading, and second of all, why it's important for them to know this. That's the kind of thing. See, what you really have to do is cut kind of every once in a while, back off and say, is everybody getting it? And if they're not getting it, maybe, my daughter Erica tells me that she will never, ever in her life again try to learn mathematics from me. <laughs> All right? uh, uh, when she was growing up, I would try to explain math to her. Now, I know mathematics quite well, but obviously, I wasn't explaining it right to her. And she just gave up. She just said, I'm not going to do math anymore. Period. It's over. You know, they said, don't you explain it to me again. And don't let have any teacher explain it to me again. And I don't want to do any of this again. And um, I would say, uh, other than being able to deal very, very well with finances, she hasn't done it again. She's also, another thing with her, which is, again, some things with some of the kids and where the high stakes stakes testing is, is terrible, is Erica cannot take an exam. She simply can't take an exam. She gets a stomachache every time she faces a test. And it really makes her ill. And um, I think, I, I, don't know, I don't know how much she got on the SATs, but we all agreed not to look. <laughs> but, Interestingly enough, she's a real intellectual. She reads, she's a sociologist, she does all kinds of stuff. So what we had to do as parents is say, let's find a college that doesn't require SATs. For her. But one that will create demands and meet her intelligence in an appropriate way. So we, we ended up, you know, we, there's where we become the real bourgeois parents, you know. We, not me, but my wife, Ta I was teaching at the time. Um, Judy took Erica on the grand tour of alternative colleges. And um, she eventually went to a, a, a very, very difficult college that was quite thoroughly appropriate for Reed College in Portland, Oregon. And Reed College was run on a seminar basis, you do graduate work from the beginning, you read only original texts, but you don't have to get grades. And you've got to work very hard. You really, and, and, and all the exams are, in effect, papers. So there are no sit-down exams. It's all exams where you write a paper. And very demanding, and it just transformed. <coughs> Five years later, she's a community organizer down in the San Joaquin Valley in California, and is a really, really, she works for a um, big foundation in, in <coughs> California. She wanted to go back to school to get a master's degree in community development. She goes to Kaplan's, takes the Kaplan test, right? Same thing happens. Stomach ache, incapacity to take the exams. She, she, tests out and does her GRE thing, and zero. I mean, just, just zero. So um, she found the program she wanted to go to, and by this time, if you're an organizer, if you ever try to go into a community and help them organize for their own development and economic development and to empower them, and she'd been all over the, the world actually doing stuff like this, you know how to talk people into anything. So I just said, go over to the first day of school. Just go over to UC Davis, the University of California Davis, to the program you want, and just <coughs> sit down and, and, and introduce yourself. And of course, in six months, she got talked herself into it. And she's out of it now. She has a master's um, in community development. So I think the Im important thing, and, and this is, again, to the educational point, because if someone can handle something, doesn't mean they don't have the intelligence to actually be very, very brilliant and functional in life. All it means is that there's something they can't handle. And so how do you support them becomes the issue. How do you become supportive of 
kids without trying to put them down and reduce them to failures. And so what you have to do as a teacher is put the word failure totally out of your vocabulary. Simply forget it as a concept. The only failure is, there, is, is the current inability to do something which may be done in the future. And, 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 and I think that I can't tell you how much your students will appreciate that. Because then they understand you're on their side. Then they understand that your struggles are their struggles. That you're there for them. Um, one of my students this, this semester is a basketball coach at a middle school and uh, used to play pro ball, um, pro basketball. Um, and he uses his um, practices and he uses his, um, he works at a very impacted, you might say, uh, a school in Oakland, California. And he's got all of his kids reading and writing and playing basketball. But they can't play basketball if they don't read and write. But he knows how to do it, because he's not punishing them. He's just saying, we're doing this together. This is our task. You know, this is our challenge. So you have all these challenges. The other thing I would like to say is find out the right age of kids for you. That is so such an important decision when you become a teacher. I remember when I was teaching in Harlem in 1961, 62, I believe, there was this woman who was a kindergarten teacher and ended up screaming at her kids. She was a nice person. I mean, she, she's a good friend. She couldn't stand uh, what was going on. I said, what's Maggie, what's wrong? She said, the kids won't talk politics. I said, you got five-year-olds. What are you talking about the kids won't talk politics? Of course they won't talk politics. It's not appropriate. Well, I said, why don't you find another way to teach? And she became one of the best junior high teachers in New York City. Because the kids are willing to argue in junior high. <coughs> all the time. And no problem. She, she got them out there arguing and talking and all. And I've, I've taught different age people, kids, at different times in my life, and I think a lot of it had to do with my needs as, a, as an adult. I love fifth, sixth graders for the first four or five years I taught. I then ran a storefront school because I really loved kids who would just drop in. This was in East Harlem, and who would, who would, who would just kind of come by the storefront. And um, I teach writing and uh, a lot of those kids are, one of them is one of the world's greatest poets. And honestly, uh, just to give you another example of what, what you have to do is, see, a teacher is a human being. A teacher has to fully respond, not as a teacher, but as a person. I think that's the crucial thing, that you have to respond to your kids as a person, not as a teacher. Because when you respond as a teacher, in, in the traditional sense. You're, you're standing on your authority, not as a human being, but on your authority as vested by an institution. Now, you do have authority in that institution, and you do know more than the kids, hopefully, about certain things, because they certainly know more about, often, their own lives than you do. And often, depending on where you teach their own communities, than, than you do. But um, I... Um, taught this poetry class, and the way I do it, this is the other thing I would do for him. This is another way to steal time. I start every day with a poem. Short poem. You begin the day with something that's challenging, moving, important, and usually coming from all kinds of poetic and cultural traditions, or even part of a poem. Um, there's a book of mine, I don't know if it's here, called The Grain of Poetry, which has hundreds of these poems in it. Um, I, I don't know whether we, we, we got that. We did, well, I have one copy which I'll bring this evening. Um, 
it's a, it's a really lovely, brand new, but just came out in paperback. It's a brand new book. It's really quite nice, and it also will teach people who don't feel they can read poetry. The whole goal is to make poetry accessible to everybody. And poetry in the largest number of voices, both culturally, personally, and in terms of gender. Very interesting little book. It took me a while, a long time to do that. Anyway, so I'm teaching poetry, and the way I would do it was we'd read a poem, then I'd ask everybody else in the class to write a poem in response to the poem we read. And I choose those things carefully. See, this, this is where the teaching really comes in, is the being very careful and thoughtful about what material you choose and how you present it. This is a major challenge. And by the way, it's a craft. It took me five years to learn how to do it. Maybe it'll take you three. But I really think that it's, it's a craft, and eventually it becomes an art, you know? And, and at that point, it's so much pleasure. Honestly, there's so much pleasure in watching other people grow. Um, so this guy by the name of Victor Hernandez Cruz uh, is, uh, comes into class, and he's about 16 at the time. And he goes around and then he reads this poem. And we all read it and I wrote, write a poem. I'm not a particularly good poet, you know, but I do it anyway. But I chose the original poem. And Victor reads this poem, I said, well, this kid's got a good memory. See, that shows my expectations for him. Then, I was about 24 at the time, 23. And, um, I said, oh, he's got a good memory. We're going to try again. We're going to trick him. So we did it one more time. And I'd already begun to forget the rest of the class. Because I, and he did it the second time. Absolutely brilliant. The third time, I said, we're going to do a poem on, um, you, you are on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. You just broke up with either your boyfriend or girlfriend. You're riding a bus past Bloomingdale's uh, on the way back to East Harlem. What are you thinking? Now I figured there aren't too many poems about that, <laughs> right? He does it again. So after class, I said, Victor, look, you are at this stage in your life a better poet than I'll ever be. There's no question about it. This is when he was 16. I want you to teach this class with me. And I can provide you with lots of resources and stuff I've read and things I've known and all. But um, you have that, not only the gift and the inspiration, but that understanding of poetry that I will probably never have. Of course, it's something very natural to you, something that I don't understand. I mean, he was the only linguistic genius I've ever truly met as a, as a student. And Victor's now um, about 50, 50 something. Has published 25 volumes of poetry. Is a um, professor at the University of Colorado Boulder in the English de and the um, Spanish department. And is considered to be one of the great poets in certainly North America, all of them, since he writes in Spanish and in English. And so he has, he, he's, he's, a, he's a Spanish writer, you know, he's a poet in Spanish, he's Puerto Rican, and he's a poet in English. Um, anyway, there's a case where you have to learn to back off and say, I don't know this stuff. You're smarter than me. But I'll help you. See, I do have some other things. I, I went out, I read more poetry after I encountered Victor than I've ever encountered in my life, simply because I wanted to keep up with him. You know? Just, just rushing to keep up with the kid. Let me get some more questions. Anybody? Yeah. I just wonder 
would happen, I think what, you, what you're seeing is the, the mentality, the culture <coughs> of schools right now. Now you can, you can tap into it, but you have to tap out of a system that's keeping kids down. That's I mean, another thing, because um, the bureaucracy of it all, I noticed how you were always fighting with the administration. And yeah, that's right. <laughs> But, you know, you want to please everyone. No, you know. No, there's nothing wrong with conflict. Nothing wrong with conflict. But I'm just concerned there is no creativity, like Dr. Chang I think you're absolutely right. I, well, there are wonderful places everywhere where teachers have been able to steal a, 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 a safe space where they can um, create things, where they've developed enough authority within their school to be able to do creative teaching. But um, it's a real struggle. It's a, it's a real struggle. Try a charter school. You know? Try to move laterally and, and, and create your own school. I mean, there are a lot of different ways to do it if you don't feel you can do it in the public schools. You know? Um, try the public schools first and, and see. But look, interview the schools. Be very, very diligent and vigilant and impatient with finding the right thing for yourself. I mean, you, you, you and that's going to be hard work, but um, there are places that I'm sure there have to be places that are fairly decent and fairly resistant. The other thing is run for governor <laughs> and change the laws. Now, I don't mean that only one way that a lot of, I advise a number of young people who really have a desire to transform the schools and, 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 and don't believe they can do it from within a classroom is work for someone who's fairly liberal in the state legislature to rewrite the laws, to interpret the laws, to create the codes, get a law degree. In other words, I, I, I think I would encourage people to teach, but I would encourage people, no matter what they do, to work towards decency in the schools. And when I, what I was talking about with potential is that the word potential has a lot of problems. Um, <clears throat> when I say that you all have potential, what does that mean? I know what it means in the context of electricity. You know, I'm going to put something through a wire and something's going to jump in one way and something's not. And, uh, and if the potential is wrong, the wire's going to fray and burn. I know, I know about that. But to say that someone has potential is, see, my belief is that everybody has an infinite capacity to grow. All right? That's the way I would rather phrase it. And, but when you say someone's high potential and someone's low potential, you are making a judgment about their future. You're not making a judgment about their present. So if I say, you have high potential and you have low potential, how in the world can I ever know that? Maybe when you're dead. But even then we don't know because maybe you didn't realize what you, all of those wonderful things you could do. Right? So I tend to avoid the notion of potential. What, um, what I, one of my teachers, I, I, I've had a, I've been very lucky to have a number of um, masterful teachers uh, who, who have helped me grow. One is a man by the name of Miles Horton, who was the founder of the Highlander Center in Tennessee, and was deeply involved in the whole history of the civil rights movement and the early union movement and other things. And, um, my wife and I had the enormous privilege of um, working for 12 years with him on his autobiography. And it's published in a book called The Long Haul, the Teachers College Press put out. Now, quite a, quite a beautiful book, I must say. Um, a beautiful book because of Miles' voice. It's not, it's not, I mean, we, 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 <coughs> I say we. Judy succeeded, with my wife, in capturing his voice in the book. I mean, that's a, there's a funny story there. Um, Miles is a, 
uh, as he would say, a mountain man. He comes from the mountains in Appalachia, and he went to Cumberland Presbyterian College, um, is a, was a, one of those Christian social radicals, deeply religious um, in a social way. Not in, a, not in a conservative way, not in a um, orthodox way, but in the sense that um, he felt that he had a mission and that um, the people who inspired his mission were um, um, Shelley, the poet, Karl Marx, who you may have heard of, though a lot of people have, don't know much about him right now, and Jesus Christ. And we did this. Now, I come from a kind of secular, socialist, Jewish family background from New York. I don't understand Christian backgrounds. <coughs> because in some funny way, I don't understand Christ. See, I just don't understand it. I, I'm not opposed, or I'm not against, or I'm not, um, you know, I just don't get it. But that's because no one in my family Right? But my wife, who comes from a uh, Presbyterian and Methodist background, Scots and Scots Irish, and uh, you know, really gets it. She really does get it, in fact. That's where she comes from. So I'm redoing Miles' book, and I'll tell you why I'm telling the story. It has to do with potential, by the way. Sometimes you've got to go far around the corner to get back to where you want to be so that people will take the journey. <coughs> Little voyage. Kids love that. That's what storytelling is all about. And so um, I, I do the, I did most of the, a lot of the interviews and Judy did some of the interviews and she did a lot of the documentation and the historical research. And then I started editing these tapes we'd done for 12 years into the book. Every time I change something, and you know, you know, when you speak into a tape, and then if you transcribe it word for word, it's terrible. It doesn't read like reading. It doesn't even read like speech. It's just very clumsy. You know, so you have a lot of editing to do to make something sound like speech. It's a highly fine craft. So I was doing a lot of this, and Miles said, "That doesn't." Sound that doesn't sound like That doesn't sound like me. That, uh, that sounds like the Bronx. That sounds like, <laughs> sounds like someone who doesn't understand what I'm saying. Every single last thing that I had added into that book got pulled out. And then I said to my wife, I said, Judy, why don't you do this final editing? She did it, and Miles said, this works. But anyway, what Miles said is that um, Miles was the teacher Rosa Parks was at Highlander um, two months before the Montgomery bus boycott. Was a good friend of Miles's. Martin Luther King Jr. went to Highlander. SNCC was organized there. The Mississippi Freedom Summer was organized there. Um, the song "We Shall Overcome" came out of Highlander. Actually, it didn't come out of Highlander. It came out of John. Uh, came out of the Carolina Sea Islands. It was a church song from the Carolina Sea Islands. And when Highlander was organizing tobacco workers and cotton workers in the 30s, people brought the song with them. It became a labor song. And then in Highlander, it became a civil rights song. Uh, anyway, Miles says, you look at people with two eyes. This has to do with attention. The one eye has to see what they are now. Has to really understand what they are and who they are now. And the other eye has to look into the future in terms of what you believe and they may not yet believe they might become. And then you adjust your eyes because as they become closer to what one eye is seeing and your two eyes are focused, the goal is to unfocus your eyes again. Not say that someone's realized their potential, but you now see what they are, so you reach to more in the future. And so you're constantly, and this is what has to do with conflict and nothing wrong with conflict, you're constantly in a state of maladjustment. 
you're, 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 you're consciously not adjusting yourself to what is because you're not satisfied with that. A very, very interesting idea. And I, I, I've, I've really spent time with that. Really, <coughs> it's, it's very important. Anyway, other questions? shouldn't be having 150 students. I mean, that's, there's a, an entire movement in the United States which you should check into called the small schools movement, small high schools movement. And it's really, really interesting. And um, let me see if I can give you a reference. You know what I'll do? I'll make the reference available to the professors here, okay? It's Michelle Fine is the person who would be, uh, in fact, she's really, she's quite extraordinary and someone might be worth bringing here at some point. But this whole, the whole notion is when you have 150 kids and you have to do that, you're being asked to do something impossible. So you have to try to tap into where other people are trying to change that whole system. Now the small schools movement is 